After the proclamation of God's word this afternoon, we'll praise God with the words of hymn 43. Beloved brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'd like to do something this afternoon that's a little bit controversial or unpopular. It's to have us think about some of Canadian history. It's not so popular today. We live in a world of cancel culture. We live in a world where people want to revise history and talk about it all in the light of residential schools and the right of in the light of statues of Johnny McDonald or whatever else. And but there's a word in verse 10 of Hebrews 2 which does remind us, and it's help, Canadian history is helpful for us in this. Uh, there's a word in verse 10. Uh, which is, refers to the Lord Jesus as the founder of our salvation. The original has a word that would, I'd rather translate not founder, but pioneer, pioneer of our salvation. Jesus Christ is the pioneer of our salvation, Hebrews is saying. And if we reach back into our knowledge of Canadian history, we can relate. Pioneers were there, those who first moved into the new frontiers of North America and blazed the way for others to follow. They were leaders, people who took on risk for the sake of adventure, people to whom we're all somewhat indebted today, whether we like it or not. Without them, Canadian history would never have happened. Perhaps the word should be rendered champion, referring to the Lord Jesus as the champion of our salvation. After all, it was not Canadian history that defined Greek culture and language, but it was the Greek history that the author of Hebrews had in mind. And the word probably referred back to Greek mythology and how a Greek god would be a champion who would serve as a hero or a liberator who would open up a new path for the people. In any case, the word is much more than the ESV's founder. Jesus does not found Christianity. Jesus blazes the trail. He is the pioneer. He does more than found it. He makes it possible. He opens the way. Without him, nothing would have happened of this. Even as pioneers open up the path to a new world, Jesus is opening up the way for us, a glorious way to a new heaven and a new earth. The word comes back beautifully in Hebrews 12, verse 2, which calls upon us to look to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus, the one who began our faith, the one who ends it, the one who does everything in between. The pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated today at the right hand of God. Jesus, the whole new world to which he is bringing us, we owe it all to him. The pioneers obviously hope for a new and better world for Canada, for America. But what do you get when sinful people act as pioneers? You get a world that takes sin along into it. You get a world that also has sin and travesty and injustice all over it. Soon it looks no better than the world we left. There's only one who will do it. Create for us a new world which doesn't have all the problems of this old world no matter where we live on it. Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let us think of that today as we meditate on these words of Hebrews under this theme. Jesus is the pioneer who leads us to a world that's, first of all, free of rebellion. Paying attention to verses 5 to 13, free of rebellion. Secondly, free of death, verses 14 to 16. And thirdly, free of sin, verses 17 and 18. Jesus is the pioneer. He leads us to a world free of rebellion, 5 to 13, free of death, 14 to 16, free of sin, 17 and 18. Brothers and sisters, what do you say to a people who are feeling overwhelmed and forsaken in a world where ungodly forces are piling up and making life ever so very difficult? If you remember a little bit from Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, 
And I talked about how the most likely scenario is that the people who are reading this for the first time are in Rome, Nero's in power, trouble's coming for the Christians, and this pastor, whoever he is, who writes this letter, the, the, the sermon, he's, he's trying to comfort them and encourage them. So what do you say as such a pastor? What do you say to encourage the people of God when life looks horrible? The people feel alone. They felt they made a mistake. They're, they're, they're tempted to go back to Judaism because maybe Christianity was a mistake. Maybe they should have just stuck in the old Jewish ways. Maybe Jesus was a mistake. What do you say as a pastor then, as a coach? You encourage them with a message about what God is going to do, what He has already done, and where He is going. And where he's going to take his people. It's nowhere more apparent than in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. That's what Hebrews is saying. Because look, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, is really an interjection in the argument, in the larger argument of Hebrews. Chapter 1 ended with this remark about the angels and said, Are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? He was talking about angels. And then in chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, this, 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 this preacher who's writing this sermon, he, he's getting excited. He wants to apply it. And so he says, don't drift away from this message. But he comes back to his message in verse 5. He talks about angels again in verse 5. And he says, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. The author of Hebrews is working with his Bible. He thinks of Psalm 8. He recites it. What is man that you take thought of him, or the son of man that you should care for him? You for a little while made him lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You put everything in subjection to his feet. Hebrews is thinking about that and it says, it wasn't to angels that God subjected everything. Psalm 8 is an expression of astonishment that God has bestowed so much honor upon humanity, remembered and cared for by the Lord, created little less than a heavenly being, crowned with glory and splendor. The man and the woman were given the status of creature king and creature queen with responsibility for the ordering of the creation under the lordship of God, the creator king. Psalm 8 is, of course, a reflection of Genesis 1. Stewardship over the earth was man's mandate. Subduing and ruling was his and her task. The beginning of the story was terrific. The sequel was awful. It was a story of human rebellion with the punishment of death for sin. But notice what part of Psalm 8 is of particular interest to the preacher. He seems to be particularly interested in the last part of what he quotes Putting everything in subjection to his feet. He highlights this verse in, in, in verse 8 and underscores its absolute character by using a, a double negative. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing that was not under his control. He wants to emphasize this part of Psalm 8. You put everything in subjection under his feet. Everything. Everything. Every part of God's wondrous creation, the heavens above, the sea below, the earth all around, was to be subject to man. His task was to explore it all and develop it all in the name of God and His glory. But the pastor who writes these words immediately realizes that this is far from today's reality. In that world of Rome where the people are cowering, In our world today, where Christianity isn't looking too great, this is far from from reality. And so he says in verse 8, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to man. We don't yet see everything in subjection to Christians, do we? He looks around, he sees Rome in control of the world, Nero ruling and threatening the Christians, Christians treated not as kings and queens, but as criminals and convicts. Today, too, what do we see of this? It's not much different. Rather than ruling the prevailing times and forces, we are being pushed to the margins of society, fearing the day when persecution returns. It's coming for the people of God. 
Now we don't yet see everything in subjection to us. But notice what this preacher, pastor of Hebrews does. He interprets Psalm 8 Christocentrically, Christologically. Notice how he adds the words, not yet. Very important. We do not yet see everything that's subject to him. In other words, it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. The fact that the decree has not yet been realized indicates that the promised subjection of everything has reference not to man in general, but to Jesus, whom God has appointed the heir of everything. You could, in fact, read those three lines of Psalm 8 entirely as references not to us, but to Jesus. And Hebrews, in fact, bids us to do so. You made him, Jesus, for a little while lower than the angels. It refers to his incarnation, his humiliation. You have crowned him, Jesus, with glory and honor. It refers to his exaltation, Putting everything in subjection under his feet, it refers to Jesus' final victory. The preacher, pastor, interprets it all that way when he says, in fact, in verse 9, a verse which I consider to be one of the most delightful verses in Hebrews, we do not yet see, we do not yet see everything in subjection to us. But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. What he's saying, he's saying the realities that were spoken of in Genesis 1 and Psalm 8 are being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when all of creation will be subject to Jesus, and if subject to Jesus, subject to those who are bought with his blood and purchased with his death. There's a day coming when the world will be subject to him, and therefore it will be subject to us. Jesus is the man in whom we see entirely restored the primal glory and authority which God bestowed on man. His experience of humiliation and exaltation guarantees that the absolute subjection of everything envisioned by the psalmist will yet be achieved. The exalted Son of God made the human condition His own in order to achieve for us the glorious destiny designed by God for all those who are in Christ. What is our history but a history of rebellion? Rebellion against God, rebellion against the very things that are good for us and good for the world. What is sin but rebellion? What is conflict but rebellion? Our problem is indeed that in our hearts we rebel against the good order that God has in mind for us. God says, you should live this way. He gives us commandments and says, you're better off to live this way. But we think, nah, I can live this way. I can live this way. I can do this. I can do that. And we make a mess of our lives. Whenever we despise the rebellion of others that we can see so clearly, we are humbled with a realization that so our own hearts are inclined. But there's a day coming, Hebrews is telling us, when all of this will be over. We will see and know God's way was the best. We'll be able to look at our own lives and say, this is where I went wrong. This is where I went wrong. You can look today at the history of Israel and say, this is where they went wrong. This is, God's way was always best, but they thought they knew better. Is that your life? God's way is best. His order is in our interests. A new heaven and a new earth is coming on which there will only be new people, people renewed through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say it of yourself? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. A new heaven and a new earth is coming on which there will only be new people, people renewed through the cross of our Lord Jesus, people who just see Jesus crowned with glory and honor and are content to live into all eternity, worshiping the King, who are content to live even today, knowing that there's a day coming when Jesus will allow us to wear that very crown and to rule over His creation with Him. 
Through Jesus, the members of the house church in Rome, hiding from Nero, are, f- are to find their comfort and their assurance of their own entry into the glorious destiny intended by God for them. The message is, your present trouble is not eternal. Nero is not eternal. The present issues of your world are not forever. There's a better day coming. Just see Jesus, and in Jesus you know it's coming. You want to see a picture of what this might look like? Well, look at our Lord Jesus in the time when He was a little while lower than the angels when He walked on the face of the earth. See what He does in the Gospels. Have you ever looked at it from this perspective? That Jesus is just bringing all of creation subject to Him. When our Lord was here on earth, He exercised exactly the dominion that we never managed to exercise. He had dominion over the fish. He could command them. He said to Peter, Peter, we need some money. Look at that fish's mouth. He had dominion over the birds, over the wild beasts, the seas and the wind. When He commanded them, they were still. He even healed the sick. He raised the dead. All of creation was subject to Him. They all obeyed Him. Don't you see in that something of the glorious world that's coming? When He will banish everything that rebels against His rule and authority, everyone who dares to say anything contrary to what is true. He, the dominion He had when He walked on the face of the earth is the dominion He has today. We see Jesus and the dominion, the total dominion He will have over that new heaven and that new earth. That's why we should not see all of this as entirely future. It's not only true in the new heaven and the new earth, it's true also today. All the good things we enjoy today, every one of them, we owe to Him, our Creator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in whatever pain and suffering the people of God experience now, and there's lots of it, they're called to lift their eyes and see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Yes, this is happening to me now, we can say. But Jesus is still crowned with glory and honor. He knows where this is at. He knows where this is going. He's leading this world and He's ruling it, bringing it to a better future. What the pioneers ultimately could not do, what the fathers of confederation ultimately could not do, because they were all just sinners, and you can rewrite history again and again and again, but they're all just sinners, and they all made mistakes, and Jesus, the pioneer, will do. Lead us to a world founded on the principles of justice and equity. Lead us to a world in which one race will not be trampled over by another race that considers itself to be superior. New people composed of all races, all tribes, all languages, rich and poor, young and old, will be around the throne giving praise to a glorious and gracious God and His wonderful Son, our eternal King. And then in verses 10 to 13, the preacher pastor makes it clear that Jesus did not do all this for his own benefit. No, he's united with his people. He did it for us. The objective, as verse 10 makes clear, was to bring many sons and daughters to glory. He wasn't just looking after his own skin. He was bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Jesus is the great pioneer, the great champion, who has all these people with him whom he is bringing into this wonderful world where all rebellion and sin will be a thing of the past. He's one with us, we with him. Hebrews takes three Old Testament passages here, interprets them Christologically and ecclesiastically. Verse 11 first says, He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. In verse 12 then, with his quotation from Psalm, 100, well, from Psalm 22, Jesus is the one who strides into the assembly to declare God's name to his brothers and sisters and lifts his voice in songs of praise to God when the congregation gathers for worship. 
He's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And in verse 13, quoting Isaiah 8, Jesus is the one who expresses trust in God as the dominant disposition of his life. I will put my trust in him. That was his strength. And in 13b, through Isaiah 8 again, Jesus is the one who puts his arms around others and says, here am I and the children whom God has given me. The preacher pastor uses the words of both psalmist and prophet to impress upon his readers their oneness with Jesus Christ. See Jesus in the heavens and know that we are all one in him. Jesus puts the complete trust in the Father in the most desolate moment of his life through that saving and transforming anguish and death. We become his sons and daughters, his brothers and sisters, and even his children. Verse 10, we become his sons and daughters. Verse 11 and 12, we become his brothers and sisters. And verse children, according to, to verse 13, we're even his children. We're all related to the one who controls the heavens and the earth. Christ rejoices in the companionship of the people of God. They are the children God has given him. They will be his for us forever. He did it for them. He did it for us. We all have one origin, verse 12 said. God set him apart as a son, and he sets us apart as his brothers and sisters and we all have one destination in the glorious family of God, people from all tribes, all tongues, and nations. Finally, color doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Place of origin doesn't matter. We finally reached a new world, pioneers, could never ever bring us to. And what was the purpose of all of this? Jesus shared our humanity not only so that he might free the world from rebellion, but, so, but also so that he might destroy our adversary, the devil who held us, held the power of death. He frees us from death as well. Look at verses 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Here the image shifts somewhat. Here clearly he's not so much a pioneer as he is the champion who comes to the aid of his people. Now he's more like a figure out of a Greek mythology, a Hercules kind of figure who comes in and beats up the devil and he's locked in mortal combat with a fearsome adversary who held the power of death. Notice that not just death, but the fear of death holds people in lifelong bondage. It's really quite ironic that the people who were destined to rule over all creation should find themselves in the position of a slave paralyzed to the fear of death. That's the depth of our fallen condition. We were meant to be kings and queens, but we became these cowards who were paralyzed because one day they might die. But this is the human condition. For the first readers, persecution was on the horizon. They all knew it meant physical suffering. It might mean death. Even aside from that, all of life is followed by death, isn't it? But if Christians knew of comfort in the face of death, unbelievers in the first century were terror-stricken when they thought about death. Euripides, for example, an early Greek writer, says about death, this other life is a fountain sealed, and the deeps below us are unrevealed, and we drift on legends forever. We drift on legends forever. Today as well, the fear of death is present wherever there is life. Subject to lifelong bondage, he says, that's what it is, this fear of death. 
I recall being a pastor in British Columbia and the local funeral director one day we're driving to a cemetery together to bury someone and the funeral director says to me, it's always a pleasure to do funerals for your people. I thought it to be a curious statement. When I asked why, she said, well, other people come in here and they are angry and they're belligerent and they're so without hope that they're totally unpredictable. But your people are kind and at peace. And they just want the best for their dear ones who have passed on. So it is. Every grave, every death, every funeral, every cemetery, every illness reminds us we are mortal. You can be young and be in denial and think you're going to live forever. But before you know it, 20, 30, 40, 50 years have passed. And you know that one of the next stages is going to be death. Death is the fear of the future. And this, they say, is the true appeal of a real late-night party. It's a vain attempt to create a little bit of eternity. Death and the fear of death is behind all our fear of illnesses, diseases, COVID, war, trouble with residential schools, you name it. It all has to do with this lifelong bondage to death. But this is reality, brothers and sisters. We either confront death early in our lives in the face of the cross and the resurrection, knowing Jesus as our only comfort in life and in death, or we will fear and cower and hide and weep uncontrollably in the face of this horrible enemy every day for the rest of our lives. It is indeed a lifelong slavery from which only Jesus can save us. Jesus is the one who will finally bring us to a world where the fear of death is no more. He became locked in mortal combat with a fearsome adversary who held the power of death. He overthrew the devil in order to release those whom this evil tyrant had enslaved. Jesus is the champion who secured the deliverance of his people through the suffering he endured. He arose, and he alone now has the keys of death and Hades. He leads us to a world not only free of rebellion and death, but also free of sin. Let's think of a few, a few minutes about the last verses, verse 16, 17, 18. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and tempted He's able to help those who are being tempted. What I find striking in these verses is that Hebrews is making the point, it's not enough for Jesus to just go off and suffer and die and bring about redemption. No, he must suffer and he must die as one of us. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect. The argument is because he's concerned about us, not angels, he has to become like one of us, not like the angels. He has to become one of us, our representative, our mediator. The high priest is chosen from among the people. He can represent them effectively only because he enjoys solidarity with the people. He's one of us, just as he makes us one with him. Only because he's one of them, he had to be made like his brothers, not just a little bit, but in every respect. Jesus needed to resemble those sorry brothers whom he had to redeem so that he could provide atonement for sin and a sacrifice unto death. Jesus' own encounter with a sinful, hostile world makes him a merciful high priest who can offer comfort and strength to his brothers and sisters then and now who face a sinful, hostile world. 
Jesus' own encounter with the horrors of death makes him the faithful high priest who can offer comfort and hope to those who face the prospect of death. It's the only way to deal with sin. It's the only way a new world can come into being. If death is a fear of the future, guilt is the fear of the past. Panic strikes when we begin to realize that that guilt from the past might just go with us into the future. How do you deal with that? You've got to humble yourself in the face of God. Fess up to whatever guilt there may be. Brothers and sisters, realize this is the only way you can go into that future that's coming in Christ Jesus. What do you think of the world is going to become new? That you're going to get in there being old and sinful? Don't you have to become new as well, like the world that you're going into? Do you want to be part of that world without rebellion, without death, without sin? What a world that will be. Do you want to be part of that? Then you've got to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope, as your only possible, your single solitary comfort, not only when it comes to death, when you stare it in the face, but even comfort in the face of life and all the challenges of life. Embrace the Lord Jesus, fess up to the past, embrace Him now, and enter a new and glorious future. It's true of you, it's true of me, it's true also of our country. It needs to come to the realization that reconciliation, for example, with the native people of this land will not just come about just by speaking empty words or by doling out millions of dollars. It will only come about when we realize this was sin, whatever it was that happened. And we don't know about all these residential schools. About them. We don't know about all that stuff. They didn't really dig up these graves. They just said, well, there's indentations here and there's problems here. And but whatever happened, fess up to it. Sin is sin, not just before people. Sin is sin before God. Yes, we can be thankful for Canada. We can be thankful for our history, but we must know and acknowledge there was a better way for us to make an entrance into this land. There was a better way to form this nation. It didn't have to mean obliterate another nation. The attempt to make one nation from sea to sea was not really done under the dominion of the one to whom, whom we see crowned with glory and honor in the heavens above today. That would have been a different history. Realistically, though, that future ideal world we all hope for will not come about unless and until it happens through the one who is today crowned with glory and honor. Our comfort is not just that he will reign then. No, he reigns now and he will bring us into that future. We see him with the eyes of faith and because we see him, we see that world coming free of rebellion, of death, and of sin. We see not only a new heaven, glorious picture, we see a heaven united with an earth, a new heaven and a new earth. Take this world, get rid of COVID, get rid of hospitals, get rid of cemeteries, get rid of funeral homes, and you have this new world, but add into it the fact that this new world will be completely under the division, under the reign of one king, one Jesus, and Jesus alone. Jesus does not just lead us into that future world. He's the one without whom it will never happen. He shapes it. He forms it. He defines its constituents and its citizens with his own cross. We owe it all to him, our brother, our savior, our priest, our champion, our pioneer. And all God's people said, Amen.